Our reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 26. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you, in order that those that are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat in? Or, you, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The word of the Lord. I was talking to a friend the other day, uh, and he was saying, he was telling me that uh, even though he's now around 50 years old, and he's checked his watch many times in his life, he's made a lot of calendar appointments, he was uh, realizing one day, he said, I have no clue what AM or PM mean. And I kind of was like, oh, you don't? I didn't know either. I was like, oh, oh. Um, Turns out AM and PM are Latin um, abbreviations for anti-meridium and post-meridium, which means before noon or after noon. Now that's something, that's a symbol, that's a daily occurrence that's all around us every day that we're around, but maybe some of us didn't know what that actually meant. And I really think that that dynamic, that same dynamic happens when it comes to some of the, the, the basic symbols and principles that are all around us in Christianity, which is exactly why we're doing this series, to unpack, to explore some of those symbols and some of those practices that are essential to the Christian faith. And today we're talking about one of those, the next one in this series, which is the meal. And so maybe you can even think about that a little bit right now. What is one of the more memorable, memorable meals, significant meals you've ever had in your life? Now, I remember uh, one of those meals for me happened when we were on uh, vacation as a family uh, when I was about nine years old, and we were in a very, very small restaurant, probably had four or five tables in it. The chef was also the waiter and probably every other job in that restaurant as well. But I remember to this day, at nine years old, I remember the environment. I remember the atmosphere. I remember even some of the conversations we had with our family. I remember the food. I remember how the restaurant looked. And I even remember some of the little things that the uh, waiter slash chef slash accountant uh, would, do, would do for us. Uh, he, would he would come over to our, I've never seen this since then, uh, but he would come to our plate, and when we were, he had eaten like, part of the dish, he would turn the plate for us. And I was thinking to myself, you know, reflecting on that, they don't do that for you at the Olive Garden. You know, they really don't. And the reality is when it comes to food, right, all creatures eat food, but as humans, we do something different. We actually go beyond that. We share meals together. But the meal that we're talking about today is from the life of Jesus. And this meal has gone on to be one of the uh, most fundamental practices in the church. Biblically, a meal can be a very spiritually significant act. 
And the Old Testament, all important moments, uh, were always marked by meals, by feasts, by festivals. And then you fast forward into the New Testament, and we find Jesus, um, meals all around Jesus. In fact, one scholar, one New Testament scholar points out that in the Gospel of Luke, uh, for example, Jesus is basically the whole, the whole book uh, either on his way to a meal, at a meal, or returning from a meal. But the most famous meal that Jesus ever had happened on that one night before he was betrayed. And he was with his friends, he was with his disciples, and they didn't know what was about to happen because they had just gathered for the Passover meal to celebrate what God had done in the past. But little did they know that this particular meal was really more about what God was about to do. And so Jesus is going to teach them something here, not just with a theory, not just with a principle, but with a tangible practice. And so Jesus passes the bread and the wine, and he says, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And so over the centuries, Christians have done just that. Some have called it the Lord's Supper. Some have called it the Eucharist. Some have called it communion. And so with that, with that has also come a debate and a discussion about the meaning of this meal. And if you grew up in church here, chances are you are today bringing some of, your, some of what you have received maybe um, in, in, in another church or another church tradition, and you are carrying that. All of us probably are carrying, if you grew up in church, carrying some of our past spiritual heritage into today and our understanding of how we view this meal. And I would guess that we're probably all over the map when it comes to our understanding of this meal. A lot of questions. Right? How do we understand it? What is happening when we receive communion? How often should we do it? Should it just be at special occasions? Should it be monthly? Should it be weekly? What's the right method to do it? Do we come up in a line and receive it from one shared cup? Do we pass? Uh, in my church growing up, we had the, the plate that had the little plastic cups in it. Maybe some of us had that, and we did it once a month. You know, I've even seen some things go wrong when it comes to communion. I remember I was at a church one time, and they had, they had these little you know, crackers, and uh, everyone received the cracker, and about 10 seconds later, you, look, you could see everybody kind of going like, like that, because someone had accidentally bought garlic-flavored crackers, <laughs> right? And so like, no one wanted to greet each other after the service. Like, um, but what should the elements be? Right? Should it be unleavened bread? Should it be wafers? Should it be uh, grape juice? What about wine? I remember even, I was in an environment one time, and this is a true story, where the person used, and it wasn't in, a, in a, like a regular church service, but the person used milk and Oreos. I was sitting next to someone, and, and the person was like, I'm not even a Christian, but this doesn't seem right. <laughs> <laughs> Right, But uh, lots of people have debated this meal throughout the years and throughout the centuries. But what we see from the teaching of Jesus and what we find in 1 Corinthians from the teaching of Paul certainly is that this meal is anything but some empty ritual. In fact, it's a place where the, new, the good news of Jesus can become very real for us. This meal is a place where we discover what God is really like. And so at Trinity, we share in this meal every week. But because we do it every week, right, anything that you do often can become sort of like background noise after a while. It can just be something you do, but you're not really even sure why you do it. And so you can miss out on the meaning. But if you miss out on the meaning, then that means you're missing out on what Jesus was really trying to show us. And that is exactly what was happening in the first century church in the Greek city of Corinth that we just read about. And so Paul is the leader of those churches. And he's pointing out that there are a lot of problems in the church. It was in a time where there was great disunity uh, in, among the Christians. Uh, there was rivalry. There was rampant immorality in the church. Christians were suing each other left and right. But some of the strongest things that, that Paul talks about and that Paul sort of rebukes here is how the Christians were practicing this particular meal, the Lord's Supper. And he says this, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. Uh, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. Right? Paul's a little bit feisty here. Right? He's saying, I have nothing good to even say about this part of your church service. Right? It does 
your times together, your church is doing more harm than good. I hear that things are a mess there. And you know what? I believe it. I believe it's true. And so here's what was happening in that time. We have to understand the context a little bit. Christians back then didn't have church buildings. They met in homes. And so what would happen often is they would, these Christians would, would, these fledgling group of Christians would gather together and someone would read the scriptures and maybe they would pray and maybe someone would unpack some of the scriptures and, and teach on it. And then they would share a meal together. Right? When I say share a meal, I don't mean they took a morsel of bread and a sip from the cup. This was a whole meal, like, like they had dinner together. And at that meal, uh, the customary uh, setup would be that there would be several couches or cushions around a common table in the middle, and you'd be very close to one another. And probably instead of in a chair, you'd probably be reclining at the table and it'd be a very intimate gathering. And where you sat was a big deal. If you remember last week, we talked about the disciples arguing with Jesus about who was on his right and who was on his left. And you only argue about that if it really matters, and it did matter. Now, I was reflecting just on this scene of uh, the Lord's Supper. About six years ago, we were in, uh, we went to Paris. I went to Versailles, you know, a very quaint starter home. <laughs> and we went into one particular room. It was just, I mean, all the rooms are enormous and ornate there. We went into this one particular room, and it was an odd arrangement of furniture, and I was kind of curious about it uh, because there was this very, you know, where the king would sit, this incredible fancy table. But then a little bit in fr- uh, behind that was uh, just this row of chairs. And I was like, what, like, what is that about? And so I, I, I looked into it a little bit, and it was this thing called the Grand Couvert, um, where... Uh, Louis XIV was big into this. Later, Napoleon did this as well. But if you were lucky enough, so you could be from uh, kind of from the nobility or even from kind of a lower, lower echelon of society, but if uh, you were in the king's favor, the king would invite people to the palace. And while the king was eating his meal, you would sit on these chairs, this actually happened, and you would just watch the king eat. Right, And so if you were well-dressed and you were from a good background, you could sit on the velvet chairs. And then the rest of the room was for people of lesser social standing. And you'd go back all the way, maybe if you weren't, kind of, you weren't quite dressed well enough or you weren't from the right family, you'd be like back toward the wall. And you wouldn't talk. You didn't share the meal. You just watched the king eat. And I was thinking about this, and it seems so crazy. It, it, it's, it's unsettling. But now think about what Paul is saying. He says, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate um, those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. The Corinthians were apparently following the dining customs of that time, even in the church where the elites ate in this elaborate setup and ceremony and rank and importance and then gave the poor the leftovers. That was happening in the church during the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. And so I want to just, let's just think about this in, in modern life. I want you to imagine that you've just been invited over to a friend's dinner party. And uh, it's an incredible spread of food there, right? They have a chef uh, they have everything you want, lobster, steak, kale, <laughs> right? Whatever you're into, they have it. Ornate dishes, um, every flavor you can imagine. Uh, the, the tables are decorated. There's, there's a jazz trio in the corner. It's a beautiful evening. And you're there, and you're, this is amazing. I get to be a part of this. This is going to be fantastic. And you go to the table, and there's name cards around the table. And you're, and you're kind of like, where am I going to sit? Who am I going to be next to? And you make your way around the table, and you're like, okay, I don't see my name. Uh, let me check again. You double check. You go to the host. You're like, hey, sorry to bother you. I just want to see, like, I, I didn't see my name tag. I just want to see where where I should be sitting. And the host is like, yeah, that's, re- that's really good. Uh, here, where you're going to sit, we have, we have a place for you. It's, see, down the hallway, um, there's a mud room over there. The dog's in his cage. It's okay. He's not going to bite you. There's a little table there. And how about you go and sit there? Your name card will be there. And uh, a few of you will gather there. And when we're done, we'll see kind of what's left over, and we'll bring it over to you. We're so happy you're here. 
And then you're, you're like, wait a sec, I thought this was a dinner party. I thought I was invited over for dinner. I thought I was a par of, part of this. They're like, oh yeah, you are a part of it. You're just over there. You see, that's what was happening in Corinth in the Christian community. And Paul says this, when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper that you eat, right? I don't know what you're doing, but that's certainly not what Jesus taught about. And so Paul here, remember, he is a shepherd to the people. He cares about the people. He cares about their well-being. And so he's like, let's hit the reset button on communion. Let's talk about this again. And so what he does then is he takes them back to that moment when Jesus was gathered with his disciples. And if you've been at Trinity for a while, you probably have heard these words before because we say them every single week. And here's what he tells them. For I received from the Lord why I delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then the same way he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, there's a lot to be said about the Lord's Supper. There's certainly way more than we can possibly say today. But I do want to think about communion and the rest of the time we have really from two dimensions. And that is from the vertical dimension and the horizontal dimension. It's really a multidimensional meal, meaning that this is really about reconciling us with God, but it's also about reconciling us with each other. And so first of all, follow the vertical angle of our relationship with God. Now, when Jesus told his disciples to do this in remembrance of him, he was foreshadowing what he was going to do for them on the cross, yes, but he was also bringing them back to some other imagery they would have been familiar with because the bread and the cup of wine would have been a known quantities to them. Because keep in mind, this wasn't just some random dinner party. This was the Passover, right? It's that meal that the Jewish people had been eating for centuries at that point and that they continue to eat today. It was a time to remember how God in the Exodus had delivered them out of slavery and specifically reenacted one night of that story where uh, the people placed the blood of a lamb over their doorposts to be saved from, um, from peril, from death. And so when God tells his people to keep eating this Passover meal, there's a way for him to say, remember how I delivered you time and time again. And so at a traditional Passover meal, a blessing would be spoken over the bread. And then the host of the bread would pass each person a piece of that bread. And by consuming the bread, you were partaking in the power of the Exodus. And then Jesus said, this cup is my blood of the new covenant. Now the new covenant, everyone in that time knew about the old covenant, where God said, I will be your God and you will be my people. But you see, things kept going very, very wrong. But God had promised that one day there would be a new covenant. And Jesus is saying in this meal, in this simple act, he's saying, this is it. I'm it. This is happening now. And then Jesus said that this was like his blood poured out. He's saying just like the Passover, when the blood of the lamb was used to safeguard uh, the people, I'm doing the same for you now. But this time, it's, it's not just for the Jewish people, it's for the whole world. And this was a big deal. This was very, very different. Now, I came across a uh, portion of a book from Thomas Cahill called the, How the Irish Saved Civilization. And some of you are Irish. You're like, yes, we did. But he talks about these two ancient cups, silver cups that were discovered in Ireland. And the first cup is known as the Gunderstrup Cup cauldron. And it comes from a few centuries before Christ. And this is incredible uh, piece of craftsmanship. And it, but it is covered with pictures of violent gods and violent warriors. In fact, one panel displays uh, one of the gods uh, cooking a squirming human being for his own meal. 
right? To appease the appetites of the gods, to feed, right? To, to get resources out of human beings, right? It's gods taking from human beings. But the second cup that they discovered is known as the Ardok chalice, and it comes from several hundred years after that, after the good news of Jesus had already come to Ireland. And like the first cup, it was an incredible masterpiece. It was a beautiful work of art. But this cup showed an entirely different view of God. This was a cup of peace. This was a cup that was designed to be used in the Lord's Supper. And as a worshiper would lift the cup to their lips, they were reminded of how God sacrificed himself for the people. Jesus gave himself in love for us. This was completely different. This was a God who would lay down his life and sacrifice for his people. This was unheard of. God giving himself for humanity that we would be in right relationship with him, that he would take our weakness and our sin and give himself for us. This meal tells us what God is really like. But there's also a horizontal element to this meal that Paul is getting at here. Because this meal is also about life together. Now, a meal, the interesting thing about a meal is that a meal can be very often a barometer for issues in a family or in a relationship, right? There's a reason why people joke about the Thanksgiving meal with all the relatives being an awkward time. Because things surface, any dysfunction, even minor, will surface around the holiday table. Meals can sometimes reveal what's broken. And so I heard someone tell uh, recently the story of his first job in high school uh, when he was working at a country club. And, uh, you know, he would mow the, he was on the maintenance crew, so he would mow the greens and he would Uh, rake the sand bunkers and stuff like that. And being on the maintenance crew as a 13, 14-year-old, there were places where he could eat, and then there were places where he couldn't eat. And so he was welcome to eat um, outside by the snack bar, but he couldn't go in the clubhouse because that was for members only. And as a young Hispanic man, as a young Hispanic boy, really, and working among primarily Hispanic men, that said something to him. This is where you are welcome, and this is where you are not welcome. Meals throughout history have been used, sadly, often to divide people, which is why the Lord's Supper issue matters so much to Paul. Now, I think if Paul were from the South... He might say to us today, see, communion isn't just about you and Jesus. It's about y'all and Jesus, right? It's both. Both matter. Now, it was common in the culture of that time for insiders to just try to like take care of themselves, extract maximum benefit from the community for themselves to enjoy what they had. Or if we think about the church world today, right? Hey, that was a decent service. The message was okay. Uh, Worship was pretty good. The kids are happy. You know what? I'm satisfied. I'm full. That was was an okay meal. You see, that's such a normal way of even thinking about the Christian community in our time and in our world. But just as we heard from Jesus last week, just because it's true in the world, it doesn't mean it has to be true for you. Not so among you. See, Paul is saying to his church, you're a body You're a family. The lone wolf, me-centric Christianity isn't something that Jesus laid out as an option for us. That's something we invented. So when we receive these elements every week, the bread and the cup, when we walk up, we're in that line. What we're really saying is the people around me, right, that's my sister, that's my brother in Christ. This is a spiritual family. That's what Paul is getting at. And so we are called to work toward relational health. We're called to as much as it is possible to resolve conflict, to treat one another well. And I really doubt that the early Christians had any easier time getting along than we do today. If 
you look at the disciples, it was a very diverse group of people from different backgrounds, different worldviews, some of them com- opposing one another fundamentally. Now, we had a, a former high school student at Trinity who used to say, when we have Jesus in common, though, we have everything in common. And here's what this ultimately means for us today, this meal. Now, later in, in today's uh, passage, Paul says something pretty interesting. He says, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, what does that mean? You know, in some circles, this means before you come to the table, work yourself up so you feel really bad about yourself right? Just everything you've done wrong, how you're a terrible person, make sure you feel nice and guilty. And then when you're done doing that, do it a second time. Just maybe you forgot something and do that and feel miserable and then approach the table of God. But is that really what Paul is talking about? Is communion God's way to just make you feel guilty every week? Or is it actually that place that offers life where he takes our guilt and our condemnation? He doesn't add to it. Now, of course, it is appropriate and true to examine ourselves to make sure that we are in vertical and horizontal wellness. That's something we have to keep checking in on every week, right? And so do I have some outstanding issues with God? Do we have like a conversation, is there a conversation that needs to happen here, right? Is there any stuff that's gotten in the way, either of of that vertical relationship or maybe a horizontal relationship with one of my sisters or brothers? You know, sometimes people will ask this question, this, this theological question, how exactly is Jesus present in the meal? And I think that's an important question. But maybe another important question for us today is, how present am I in this meal? Am I bringing my full self to the table, everything? You know, I heard someone, a pastor one time, sort of angrily saying to a group of Christians, you know, are you worthy to come to the table? And I was thinking to myself, and I was like, no way. I'm not. But the table isn't based on my perfection, it's based on his. The table isn't sort of like the gold medal for the perfect Christian. I like what Jack Hayford, the pastor Jack Hayford once said. He, he talked about when, you know, when we tell people that they first have to be strong before they come to the table, it's the same thing as saying to a person who's dying of malnutrition, hey, after you get over that, uh, we'll let you have some food. See, the price of admission to the table is just your need. I, it's when you say, I need Jesus, and I place my trust in him because Jesus has picked up the tab for it. I do think, though, sometimes about that scene in Versailles. The king up on a pedestal in the distance, the people away from him. And I wonder if for some of us, that's a little bit how we see Jesus today, maybe. Or we're worried that that's how he is, that that Jesus is sort of aloof, He's over there, he's at a distance, he's doing his own thing. But what we find in the gospel is that that's not how Jesus is at all. You know what Jesus was called by some of his opponents? A friend of sinners. That is, he spent meals, he spent way too many meals with the wrong sorts of people. He would hang out with them, he would invite them over, right? A friend of sinners, and they meant it as an insult. But to Jesus, it was a badge of honor. He came for people like me. People who are far from perfect, but have come to see his goodness and his forgiveness. And I think in our time now, in in an age of such distraction and such noise, we need this table more than ever. Because the world is going to fight for your attention. Now, of course, the table is not the only place where we can encounter Jesus. We can encounter him, encounter him in anywhere, in any facet of life, but the table does give us a focal point. And so communion, again, it's not just some empty ritual. It's actually a chance, an opportunity to welcome the transforming work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, right? That's why the people of God have been doing this all this time. That's why we 
That's why we do it today. Amen? Amen. So let's, let's stand together now, and, and, and we're going to do, uh, do just that.